Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy, both physically and mentally. So it is the middle of April here in Nova Scotia. Spring has started, but uh, spring in Nova Scotia comes later than it does to most of the world. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's beautiful. I don't see clouds anywhere. The air is still. The uh, temperatures, though, are still running around five degrees Celsius. So I've been watching the ground to see if there's any new growth. And one of the indicators that I like to look for is the Mayflower, the uh, plant symbol for Nova Scotia. And little buds, but they're not open yet. So it's a little bit too early for me to show you Mayflowers. I don't see anything else coming up. Well, I see buds on the ends of the maples, the little winter bugs ready to burst. Same thing for the, yeah, same thing for the birch. They're coming out, but not much to show you in, pl in the way of plant life left yet. And would you believe we had quite a bit of snow, we had quite a bit of rain all spring, but already it's the middle of April and we're under a fire ban. The uh, fire restrictions start in Nova Scotia on March 15th and they run through to October 15th. And for those of you who live here, you probably already know it. And, and if you don't, let me quick explain. So the fire restrictions in Nova Scotia are such that between March 15th and October 15th, there is no burning permitted between 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. So no breakfast fires for if you're out camping. Then at two, before 2 p.m., they make a decision if they're going to allow fires for the rest of the day. So the next segment of time is 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. And they will say either it's a green, you're free to have a fire, or it's orange, which means that you can ha can't have a fire until after 7 p.m. If it's red, it means no fires at all. So... For the last week and a half, would you believe we've been under an orange fire ban, meaning I can't have a fire here until 7 p.m. in the evening. But I do plan on cooking myself some lunch. So how am I going to do it? Well, that's what I come out to do today, is to share with you how I'm going to cook my lunch during a fire ban. If you're interested in seeing what it is, follow along. Oh man, this is what it's all about. This is one of those perfect days. Still, very little breeze, not too warm. Sunshine, not a cloud, not a cloud in the sky. Some little flies flying around, I don't know what they are, but the good news is they're not black flies, they're not mosquitoes, they're nothing that bites. There's a lot of them, though. wonder what comes out this time of year. I'll have to look that up. This is my playground. This is the Blue Mountain, Birch Cove Lakes Wilderness Area. Within the city of Halifax, almost 7,000 acres of prime wilderness. What a treasure, eh? But there's a lot more to show you, and I've got a lot more to do. Ooh, wintergreen. Oh, yeah. Mmm, more wintergreen. Mmm, what a taste. Mm, quite a few of them around here. Labrador tea, cool. Not in blossom yet, another few weeks before it comes to a blossom. Okay. So you can uh, obviously tell I've switched into a frame pack, very old school. I think it's a Camp Trails one I picked up recently. Haven't adjusted it. 
and I've got it way overloaded with stuff today. <laughs> this is not an ultralight hike. All right, let's get this camp set up for the day. I'm not sure if the microphone's picking it up, but uh, I think every time I come out, there are search and rescue helicopters doing flyovers, low fly pass, setting down close to the water. Sometimes there are actual rescues. Not today, I don't think though. I don't, I don't think, but you never know. Maybe there is a rescue going on already. All right, first job of the day, set up. The hammock chair. Okay, looks good. I guess that's one of the things about being in a wilderness area that's so close to the city is that a lot of people are coming out to enjoy it, especially during this uh, time of pandemic and lockdown. But not a lot of them are very experienced at being in the woods. And while I encourage people to come out, <sighs> yeah, while I encourage people to come out, they really do need to realize this is not a public park. This is a wilderness area and you can get lost in here and things can happen. The only good news is, is that there is good cell coverage, at least most of the areas. I mean, when I drop down into some of the ravines, I've noticed my cell coverage drops. So when people get into trouble, this is probably the area of the province where there are more rescue calls for search and rescue than anywhere else. And it's exactly because of that, the, the density of the population, not in this area, I am so fortunate, the place I go to, it takes me an hour and a half to get here, but when I get here, rarely does anybody pass by, and I'm well off the, the path as well. I have this to myself, and all I hear right now, unfortunately even that, is that helicopter, not another sound. So before I do anything else, I think I'll just sit back and enjoy the silence. All right, so I guess you've already figured out from the title of this video what it is that I'm going to be doing today. And that, of course, is I'm going to be cooking with my Swedish M40 military mess kit, the stainless steel one that I reviewed not so long ago. If you're interested in seeing my thoughts on this, you can, uh, I'll put a link at the end of the video and in the video description below. Uh, it's a heavy piece of kit, but what you can do with this, well, you're going to see what I'm, what I'm doing with this in a minute. And what else am I using? Something else that's heavy and bomb-proof, the firebox and stainless steel. So I'm going to use these two things in my fire pit only because it's a nice sheltered area. It's because uh, I can't have a fire. And that means no wood and no wood pellets. Yes, I can use alcohol, and I may do that for a cup of tea, but for what I'm going to do, I need a steady, high amount of heat. I'm going to be baking and grilling. So I have charcoal. So that's what I'll do is I'll set up in the fire pit right behind me here. And I'm going to be loading the firebox up with charcoal. And uh, then we're going to be making some bannock. Very different. Something I have not made in the woods before. So uh, I'll show you as I go. So my fire pit's a little bit in the shadow right now. But uh, it'll lighten up in a few minutes time. So let's set the firebox off. Okay, I think I'll turn it this way. I'm going to face it a little bit towards you like that because uh, when I get to baking, I want you to be able to see inside of the M40 as I go. So that looks like a pretty good... Now, here's the idea. Take my M40. I'll be putting what I'm baking inside of that and that's going to go right on top and that'll cover it over to hold the heat in. And yes, I do have something to support one of my bannock above the bottom of the pot there. And what's cool is the handle should act to be able to allow me to put a few coals on top for some top browning as well. But one step at a time, let's get the charcoal lit. Piece of uh, 
I had one of my, my viewers call it wood wool, and I've heard it called wood wool before, but it's actually a brand by Royal Oak, and it's called Tumbleweed, but basically it's wood wool. Way more than I'll need for something like this. And God love it, chunk charcoal. Huge piece, oh, that's probably too big. Let's try that. Takes a little while. I'm doing this first, of course, because it takes a little while for this to build up to heat. Yeah, that's a good start. Some of that will fall down as it uh, gets going. All right, I'm going to reposition the camera and uh, we'll put the bannock together and I'll talk about what makes this one special or different anyway. Okay, let's get started on lunch or the first half of the lunch. So I am making a bannock, but this is a brand new recipe. Uh, I've tried it at home just to see. I just haven't tried it out in the woods yet. So this is a low carbohydrate recipe for bannock. And there's, so there's no flour or any other grain in this at all. And the, the contents, I'll just name them, but not the proportions. If you're interested, I'll put the recipe or at least what I've uh, come up with for a recipe in the in the uh, video description below. So the primary ingredient is almond flour. So basically super ground blanched almonds provide almond flour. Now there's no gluten in almonds and that can be an issue when you're making bread or bannock because it won't hold together quite like a flour will where the gluten chains help to hold it together. But uh, there's a couple things of tricks I've got here. I've also got some, what else have I got in there? Psyllium husk. Psyllium husk is the husk of psyllium, I guess. <laughs> I don't know a lot about it, but uh, it is a fiber that I can put in this. And what is interesting about it is it does act to bind things up uh, to a certain degree. And there is some other ingredients in there that off the top of my head, oh, obviously baking powder, salt, and uh, that are in there as well. Now, uh, this is going to be a, not your easy, I shouldn't say not easy, but not your typical bandit. So I've got about a cup of materials, a little bit more. So I'm only going to pour about half of this into the top half of my M40. What have I got there? Yeah, because I don't need a big bannock. I've also got something else I'm eating. This is not my lunch. This just goes with my lunch. Yeah, okay. Main part of the lunch, beautiful Italian sausages. That's what my main part of this lunch will be. So... How am I going to get that to uh, hold it together? So if I could have, and I would at home, and I could have easily here, you cut butter in, just like you might with a bannock. You can use butter or uh, margarine. I'm not a fan of margarine for bannocks anyway. I could have used ghee. I could have used coconut oil for this as well. Basically put some in and use your fingers until it's, uh, you know, all combined. Make sure your fingers are clean. Make sure it's all combined into a, you know, a, a crumbly kind of a dough, and then add your liquid ingredients. Alternatively, olive oil will work well for this as well. One other ingredient, an egg. I likely will need no water at all between the egg and the olive oil on top of those dry ingredients that you can see in there right now. See if I can bring that up there. See the dry ingredients. So let's start with the olive oil. Uh, I tend not to measure much. That's about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more. So all I'm doing here is just, oh yeah, coconut flour. That's one of the other things in here, coconut flour. And flaxseed, ground flaxseed. That's the other ingredient. All I'm doing right now is just combining the oil with my dry mixture until it's nice and crumbly. Just like you were making any other bannock or, or biscuit dough where you cut butter in. So why am I doing this? Why am I making something non-traditional? Uh, I'm looking at some alternative healthy foods that I can take on the trail. I'm going low carb these days. It's made a huge difference in my health. So that's another discussion, but that's what I've got so far. You can see the oil's made it all crumbly. Let's add the egg. One egg. Mix that in. Now, between the almond flour and the egg, especially the egg yolk. Ooh, that egg went a long way. I think I'm gonna have to add some more material. That's why you don't put all your dry ingredients in first. 
always hold some back. Uh, it's going to be very yellow. First time I did this, it reminded me of an almond cookie. Okay, that is way too wet. However, having said that, if I let it sit, it'll also start to soak up the wet ingredients. It's already doing that. It's getting thicker as we sit, but I am going to put a little bit more dry ingredients in to get it to something I can pick up with my hands. So it's not sticky anymore. Oh, that's close. That's pretty close. Actually, that's... Let me just let that sit for a minute. Yeah, actually, I think that did it. Yeah. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. And what I'll be doing is this is the uh, small grill that comes with the firebox. So that's what I'm going to be putting it on inside of the M40. Where's my M40? You'll get an idea now. So I'll put it on this. Trying to get back in frame. Put it inside. Put the cover over. It'll heat up through. I'll see if I can't get a few coals on top to brown it. Uh, it works pretty good. Now, I've, I did it with uh, regular charcoal, and it took a little bit of time. It really doesn't burn. It, it you know, cooks very well. So, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll go with it, and I'll show you. This is not the easiest thing to use for baking. Certainly something like a zebra billy can with the locking lugs or the locking clips that you can get from the firebox stove make life a lot easier. But this will withstand the heat very well. And it, well, I'll show you how it works. It does work, so that's, that's all that matters, right? Okay, when it's time to put it up on the charcoal, we'll bring it back and we'll go from there. All right, I think the charcoal is well enough engaged to get the show on the road. So what I'm going to do is, oh, here's something I want to show you. Uh, I recently purchased a couple of titanium implements off of Valley Express. I don't even know what brand these things are. H-W-Z-S-S-E-N. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> inexpensive titanium fork and spoon. They're oh, five inches long, and that's exactly what I want, just something lightweight. And here's the reason why. Um, I'm going to start make, using them more often for a set of tongs for cooking with. This, I think I may have mentioned this in another video. This is a piece of PEX, PEX, P -E -X, piping that you would use for, uh, well, piping or, or plumbing around the house for water plumbing. It, it's nice flexible stuff. The tubing itself is really great to work with. It's a nice modern invention. But I saved about three inches of it, flattened it out with a heat gun, bent it over, and it remains very, very springy. And the ends of it are just open up enough that I can put in my fork and spoon. And I know it looks exactly like something you might buy at the firebox stove. And it Pretty much is exactly what you might buy at the firebox stove, except I made it for much less. The, the fork and spoon are maybe five, six dollars Canadian each, but they that works really well for grilling. So what I wanted to do with this now is take out at least one good piece of charcoal, maybe two. Yeah, I'll take out two, two pieces of charcoal. Man, there's some heat in there, because I'm going to put them on top of the M40. So here is. I'm not even sure that I'm in frame, so I got to bring my monitor around. Good, I am in frame. There is my bannock made from almond flour, coconut flour, psyllium husk, uh, flaxseed, ground flaxseed, and baking powder, and olive oil and an egg. Right, okay. So that's my bannock, and now I'll just put that right in inside of the M40 like this, and put the cover on. And uh, we'll put it right up on top. And the firebox stove is ideally situated for using the curve. And I know, yes, you could, there's a, a trick where you can put the, the fire sticks up at angles to support a pot, a round pot. Don't need to do it with this. Works perfectly well. I am putting the flap up the, in the back a little bit. And uh, yeah, so we're ready to go. The trick is going to be when I have to check it. So I do have gloves because I've done this and it gets really, really hot. But oh yeah, that works, okay. Using the wire bale handle to put some heat on top. I could probably throw another one on, but I think that's fine for now. 
All right, so my experience is 10, 15 minutes, but uh, we'll come back and have a look at it in maybe 10 minutes to see if how close it is to being cooked. Hopefully it is, because then I want to get my sausages on. All right, so full disclosure, I did check it once already to see how close it was. It's been about 15 minutes. Um, I'm finding when I do this that it doesn't seem to overcook. Now, maybe whether or not that's the, the, the recipe for the bannock or not, but I don't seem to burn when doing it this way. Uh, so, so I could leave it a little bit longer, but I don't need to. Now, just a little thing I picked up or made off of a little branch on the, on the ground here. The loop that would secure the M40 through the handle right here is the easiest way for me to pick it up a little bit. And I do have to pick it up slightly because the the uh, cover has to clear the firebox in order for me to pull it off. So I'll show you what I mean. Take my two pieces of charcoal off. So I just slide a little piece in. I can't handle it with your hands, right? And lift it a little bit. That way I can work the end off. And there is my bannock. And that is looking good, smelling good. I'd already, oh, I'll show you what I did. Just a little piece of the end of a pine branch for a toothpick. And it came out clean and dry, so it is ready. The trick is not to drop it on the ground. I'll slide it over to the plate here. I'll show it to you in a second. I have to use my uh, grill now for my lunch. So I'll take this off, set that aside, and I'll be putting the grill on after I put a few more pieces of charcoal in, let them come up to temperature so that I can grill my sausages up. Okay, let me reposition, I'll show you the bannock and then I'll get set up for the, for the uh, sausages. All right, there's my bannock. Ooh, hot. Okay, just starting to brown. You know, I could have left that a little longer, but it is done, it came out dry. So it didn't brown much on top, a tiny bit soft on top, but it, like I said, it came out dry, so it is done. Now it's gonna be cold by the time I go to eat it because I gotta put the uh, sausages on, but that's okay. So now I'll get set up and we'll put some sausages on. Oh yeah, starting to grill already. So in case anybody's interested, these are locally made. They're called a sweet Italian sausage. Uh, you know, as soon as you say sweet, you expect to see sugar or something else inside of it to uh, sweeten it up, but uh, that's not the case. And this is just a few red peppers and green peppers, I think is what's, well, I'm not, I think I did look at the, the ingredients in it. That's what's in it, and they will add a little bit of a sweet flavor in themselves. So, looking good, but I think I'm gonna to have to keep these moving constantly. Oh yeah, it's a little stuck already. That was not unexpected. There, oh, that, that'll give you an idea. What, what was that on, 10, 15 seconds? You're under no impediment using charcoal. In fact, charcoal is a real advantage when it comes to this type of cooking. Steady, even, intense heat. Yeah, that's looking good, eh? See if I can't get them on edge to get them seared up all the way around. Like that. It's gonna take a few minutes for these to cook. I'll be working at it and then uh, I'll come back when my lunch is ready to eat. All right, that did not take long at all. Not long at all. What do you think of that? That's looking pretty good, but I have to reset, reposition, or reset up the uh, firebox so that I can get some water on. So let's get the grill off. Actually, I don't even think I need to use the fire sticks for this. Push the, the damper down. Put my M40 on top, right directly in like this. Spans the whole thing, works well. And with that much heat, I don't think it'll be long before my water comes to a boil. And then I'll make some coffee, but in the meantime, let's enjoy some lunch. Okay, let's, uh, let me show you what I've got here. Tilt the camera down. 
my low carb almond flour, coconut flour, all that other stuff, bannock, and my two hot Italian sausages. Let's see. Is it hot? No, it's not too hot. Okay. Put it right on my lap. I want to show you the bannock. I haven't even broken it yet. Let's have a look. Okay, that looks like bannock to me. Hmm. Okay, a little bit of a unique flavor. Um, nothing wrong with it, just different. A little bit of a... Get my napkin out. A little bit of an almond flavor, that's all. Nothing, you know, hugely different. Nothing you have to put up with kind of a deal. Very tasty. Actually, considering that there was no sugar in this, it's, they're surprisingly sweet. <laughs> That's a good sausage. Man, they grilled up fast on that firebox with charcoal. Mmm. A little bit of spice to it, nothing that's going to call, you know, burn your mouth hot. I can't get over there. And the nice thing about having bannock with the sausages, they're, they're leaking a little of oil, and the bannock's going to soak some of that up. And that's my whole lunch. A low carb, high fat, well relatively high fat, Moderate protein meal. That's what this is all about. Okay, I'm going to enjoy this meal and then go back to making coffee. And I can see how much shadow I'm in. Holy smokes. Big pine tree right in front of my face. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody else has been working on a low-carb bannock recipe that they don't mind sharing. I'll share what I've got. It's a biscuit recipe for, for all intents and purposes. And uh, I'll share what I have. But if you have any low-carb bannock recipes that uh, you want to share, put them in the show notes. Oh, oh, this is important. I almost forgot to mention this. The idea of baking in the M40 came from uh, some research I was doing looking for cooking with the M40. And I came across a channel, I, I will put the, a link to the guy's channel and his name on the screen now, Kababus, K-A-B-A-B-O-S-C. I probably have that spelt wrong, but I'll put the correct spelling on the channel. I believe the guy is in Germany, but I watched him bit do some baking with his M40. I think it's the alum aluminum version. But he's baked pizza, he's baked uh, cakes, he's baked... Well, I don't know if he's baked bannock or not, but he's done quite a bit of baking in his M40. So that's where I got the idea. So it's not original to me. I may have done a little bit different than he did, but I think he did it over the alcohol stove. And I tried that, and I ran out of alcohol long before my bannock was ready. But, uh, yeah, in any case, it works well enough over charcoal. Okay, let me enjoy this meal, and then we'll set up to make a little bit of coffee. So I turned the camera around... Uh, so that the sun was up over my shoulder so I get a little better lighting of course what happens now is I'm facing the wind the wind is coming directly at me but I've got the little wind sock on my microphone so hopefully it's going to cancel out enough wind that you can hear what I'm saying so I'm going to make coffee and it's been a while since I've actually demonstrated doing this so I thought why not I'm going to be using the AeroPress uh, that's no surprise to anybody that follows my channel, AeroPress. Despite all the other methods of coffee making that, that I use, the AeroPress remains at the top of my list. I, I, I can't say enough, but we can talk more about the AeroPress another time. What did I want to share with you today? Okay, you have seen this before. It's part of a set of items that was sent to me by my friend Rob Young from the Crafted Woodsman. And this is a little coffee sack. Now, I don't put my coffee directly in this. I keep it in a tin that I, I, I want to talk about the tin for a minute because the people have been asking me about this. Um, two years ago, three years ago, the Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering, the organizing committee, felt that they'd like to create a swag bag for everybody. And one of the things that we looked for was tins, some type of a tin that people could keep things in. Now, ideally, we would have found 
metal tins that would have withstood being thrown in the fire to make char cloth with. But uh, we couldn't. What we did find was aluminum tins, tins or containers, screw top aluminum containers. So we bought a quantity of those and we passed them out to, as uh, swag or door entry packages to everybody. I don't know what everybody else did with mine, but I find it perfect for carrying coffee in. And uh, what I carry in this is my Rampage coffee. Yeah, you guessed it. I don't know if I've given a real close-up of that logo. That's their logo for Rampage Coffee. I think you're like this on the back, though. They have a, a number of good things. Is that picking up? Hopefully that's... If I hide my face, maybe it'll focus in. Warning, highly addictive. Yeah, it is. So I am, I am going to be grinding the coffee, so I won't make you watch the whole grinding process, but I'll start it out. Little grinder. Been a while since I used this because I was just bringing it out pre-ground from home. Ground that morning, but still pre-ground. Little, little coffee spoon. Oop, drop one. Gotta find that. Three tablespoons. Drop two, where'd it go? Oh, there they are. Yes, I'm picking my coffee off of the ground because it is too good. Where'd the other one go? There it is. Too good to waste. Get back up here. All right. Top on. Lever on. Uh, brand name for this grinder? None. Zero. Made in China. Picked up off of AliExpress for about seven or eight dollars. Yeah, there are better ones. There are ones that you can spend a lot more money on, but for the AeroPress, it's not as, at least I don't find it as, as critical to have that even grind that an expensive one will give you. If you're using something like a pour over uh, and you want to make sure that you don't have fines, the very fine powdery coffee come through, then maybe you want something else. But with this, this the, the paper filter seems to keep all the fines or the very, like again, powdered coffee back inside. So I'm not concerned about having a perfect grind. But it does allow me to alter the coarseness of the grind. So if I want to make cowboy coffee, then I can make it coarser for that. Or French press, that also requires a coarser grind. Actually, I never even looked. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Wanted to see what the fineness of the grind was. But it does take a minute or two to do. I can smell it. Okay, when I finish, I'll reposition the camera and the water's boiling. Didn't take long with that charcoal and the M40. I'll reposition the camera so we can pour some coffee or pour some water into my AeroPress. All right, coffee is ground. Put that aside, gloves on. So right about now, my friend Rob Young, who gave me that, where did my spoon go? Oh, there it is. Who gave me that uh, coffee set and the other little utensil set that I reviewed previously is going to freak because he is as much of a coffee person, maybe more than I am, if that's even possible. And the reason he's going to freak is because I've got to take the water off of the heat and it is boiling hard and you never put, or you're not supposed to put, boiling hot water directly in your coffee. You're supposed to let it settle down a little bit. The ideal temperature for making coffee like this, uh, well, if water boils at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, then 190, 195 Fahrenheit is good for coffee. Don't want it too hot, which would be about 90 or so Celsius. The rule is not a hard and fast rule. In fact, if you have lighter roast coffee, the temperature is not as critical as it is with darker roast. Darker roast coffee and hot, hot water tends to make your coffee a little on the bitter side. That's according to the experts, and it does make a difference. I'll say it from my own experience as well. So. That's hot. How am I going to pour this? I did not, well maybe I still can do it. Set it up so that I can use the... If I get that in there. 
what I'm trying to do is the method of running the hook through there we go like this or maybe I'm not going to get it there we go yes I did or maybe not too hot to play with okay so I'll just do it very carefully I'm going to try and pour my water in. I should have set that up the way I wanted it before I took it off of the stove or even before I put it on the stove. But that went in okay. Now that's hot. Put the top on. I still need to give it a few minutes to steep in there. Now that's not going to give me 8 or 10 ounces of coffee. It's strong enough with 3 tablespoons to be 8 or 10 ounces of coffee. So what happens is, when I press it into the cup, I'll pour a little extra water in just to make up the difference in volume. And I can keep that warm off of the heat just by having it set aside. Alright, and when it's time to press the coffee, we'll come back. I don't know, 4 or 5 minutes. It should be ready. <laughs> Nothing in there. Turn it upside down and press. Don't have to press too hard, just an even steady pressure. In fact, if you press too hard, I find it leaks out the side and spills over the edge, so just a nice even steady. All right. Some hot coffee. I'll show you how I fill it up in a second. A little trick. At the very last second, or after, when you're finished, draw back maybe an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch. And what that does is when you take the top off, it pulls the filter back just a little tiny bit and makes it easy to pop out. Now, if you have a nice roaring fire going, actually it'll still work with what heat I've got left, I can dispose of the grounds directly in the fire just this easy. Done. Pretty much clean, not perfectly clean, but you know, enough to, that I can rinse it off and it'll be ready to go for another cup of coffee. And those grounds will be uh, burnt up by the time I'm finished. All right, now, what I wanted to show you a minute ago that I couldn't quite figure out because I was trying to record it, and of course it always happens like that, is this is the way it's supposed to be hooked in on the handle. So now that I can pick it up and use it like this, and pour a little bit more water in. Yeah, maybe eight, a little bit more than eight ounces. That smells perfect. Okay, ah, I'm ready to sit back and enjoy a cup of coffee. I'll have you join me if you don't mind. Okay. Oh, get the coffee. Ah. If you don't have one of these hammock chairs, make one for yourself. I'm sure I showed how to make it in one of my videos, but uh, <laughs> you know, for the couple of ounces that it of material that it, that it and space it takes up in my pack, I show using it this way with a tripod most often. But you can set it up like a small hammock between two trees if you don't have the materials to make a tripod and sit in it. Do you know? I figured another use for it if you're hammock camping and. Uh, you're looking for a gear, what they call a gear hammock, which is just a smaller hammock, sometimes suspend it underneath your sleeping hammock or beside your sleeping hammock, but still under the tarp. Uh, you know, this would double up as that for sure. So you could suspend this underneath your hammock and throw your gear in there off of the ground, keep your boots dry and all your other gear dry. So it has a few uses that way. I could use it as a ground cloth. Now, mind you, it only covers from, we'll say, the top of my head to just below my butt or maybe down to my knees. So it's, it's not a full length ground sheet. But with the tarp that I have with me, if I was stuck out here, I could lay this down. It would keep me dry and, uh, you know, not warm, but it'll keep me dry anyway. Enough that uh, so it doubles up as a bit of a cloth that way. It, I guess there are a number of uses it could be um, pressed into, but the best use is what I'm using it for right now. Ah, oh, that's nice. Oh, I did that right.
I'll tell you what's cool. I threw the coffee into the firebox on top of what was left of the charcoal in there, and the coffee is smoking. So <laughs> there's a, a smell of uh, fresh roasted coffee wafting through the woods here in addition to what I'm drinking. <laughs> I often wonder if that'll attract wildlife. If there were any black flies, it might work to repel black flies, but not yet. No black flies yet. Well, I'm glad you stayed with me through this video and came out and joined me on my hike here this mid-April, early spring day in Nova Scotia. I'm glad I was able to share my lunch with you. Hopefully, I don't know, maybe you've seen something like that before. If you have, then please let me know that you've seen baking with the Swedish M40. First time I've tried it in the woods. I, I practiced with it at home, so it wouldn't be the first time I tried it. Uh, and, you know, I've got a few, some experience with it now doing that. That M40 is one bomb-proof piece of kit. You know, I don't know how many pots I would actually bake over that much heat and expect them to stand up. But, you know, that it's like it never even noticed the heat. Yeah, it's, it really does double up as so many things. So, so if you have experience baking with the Swedish M40 or M44, the, the, uh, the aluminum version, let me know. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing what you've baked with it. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll try that out as well. I also mentioned the, the bannock. If you have bannock recipes that are, don't involve any grains, no flours or anything else that are low carb in nature, uh, share them with us and I'll share them back out to the community. Uh, if you have any questions about coffee, I know somebody has asked and I have been planning for some time now to make a video on cowboy coffee or camp coffee or bush coffee. It has any number of names. And there are vari variations, and I've done the research with the experts on coffee and all the experts out in the woods. So uh, I think I'm ready to give you a video. It's just a matter of getting that done. Might be my next video. We'll see. Folks, the pandemic is still with us, and it looks like it will be for some time. We are so fortunate here in Nova Scotia. Our numbers are very, very low. And there's any number of reasons people will say that uh, the reason for that here, but I believe it's because of the good management on the part of our government and our public health people that, uh, you know, and the people of Nova Scotia, because we've been under a lot of restrictions. We haven't been as open as some places have been, but in paying for it, we paid in advance. So it's kept us very safe here in Nova Scotia. Not virus free but still very low in comparison to other places i pray that wherever you are in the world that the pandemic uh, is starting to come to an end we're in what is it the third wave caused by the the variants right now that's what they're saying here in canada we have the vaccine being rolled out i've had my first shot and I won't get my second one until July. <laughs> That's what they've spaced it out that far. But, you know, I feel fortunate. I, feel, I just feel fortunate to be here and to be able to do what I'm doing, which is to get out in the woods. And I know not everybody can. If you can, what are you waiting for? Get out there. Get out and enjoy the woods. Your mental health will thank you for it. If you can't get out, I hope that in some small way, I've been able to bring you a little bit of relief as you sit home and... Uh, weather out the pandemic. Stay healthy, folks. Stay safe. And we'll see you in the next video. And in the meantime, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.